Thank you so much. I greatly appreciate at the end of this meeting, which was intense and uh, very lively, that you're, some of you are still here. I was taking attendance, but uh, okay. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you for being here again. Uh, thank you, Rama and Sravan, for organizing this meeting and uh, inviting me to be here. So this is uh, sort of the view from my office, which I have to give up in six months. So um, anyhow, um, I want to talk about uh, scaling in general um, and uh, my own uh, frustrations uh, with the general idea. Um, in uh, engineering and physics, and life in general, there are things that scale and many things that don't. If you take an elephant and scale it down to the size of a deer, I'm not sure that it survives. Likewise, uh, the reverse thing, take a deer and scale it up to the elephant's size, then it's not at all clear that it is functional and sustainable. Uh, even in those phenomena where things scale, and I will explain what I mean by that. Um, if you introduce a new uh, physical phenomena, the scaling will be interrupted or uh, something else will happen. So why worry about scaling or why should all of us, and some of us at any rate, should be worried about uh, scaling or do worry about scaling? In part, uh, this has been um, the uh, intellectual power of the uh, revolution that uh, took place in critical phenomena uh, between, say, 1960s to 1980, culminating at the, with the Nobel Prize that Ken Wilson got, which has certain beautiful ideas um, and, um, and an enormous capacity to calculate certain things for uh, a class of problems. It doesn't mean that it is valid for everything, but I write it down and then say, uh, why, uh, in what context, uh, do such um, scaling uh, make any sense at all in fluid dynamics of the sort that the center of gravity of this community is interested in? And then I will say a little bit about uh, my own uh, search for certain things. Um, so near the uh, critical um, point, if you write down the free energy, um, it will have such a behavior where uh, the critical point would be a, with respect to T and H, two parameters. And uh, you have a scaling on T, which is simply, for example, if you're the phase transition, it would be the distance from the, uh, from the critical temperature it will go like some power, and then you will have a scaling function that will moderate it in this fashion. For example, it would this be another coordinate divided by t to the power some uh, number delta. And also, if you made a two-point correlation of the fluctuations near the critical point, then this two-point correlation function might diverge, that is, diverge as t goes to zero, it will be, it will go to infinity, and of course you have this moderating uh, scaling function. Now, before you say, well, what kind of things really go to infinity at any critical point in fluid dynamics, a classical fluid dynamics, I want to give you an illustration of something that is like this, even though the two examples I plan to give will make someone like Rahul blush, uh, who knows all this um, uh, very well. But still, I think these are good examples to have in mind. Imagine you have a circular cylinder at low Reynolds numbers, uh, around which you have the flow, and we know that around 40 in Reynolds number, it will begin to shed vertices. Now, you can do this experiment very uh, simply, but with great control. 
Now keep the flow initially at Reynolds numbers below 40, which is where the vortices appear. And now suddenly increase the Reynolds number, let's say to 65. Then what happens is the vortices begin to form and there's a certain time involved during which these vortices uh, begin to form. And you can actually measure this very accurately and everything. And now, you reduce the second Reynolds number instead of going from below the critical value to 65, you go to 55. And then you ask yourself, how long does it take for the vortices to form? And then it'll be some time, but it'll take longer at this Reynolds number because the Reynolds, the Reynolds number is lower. And in fact, you can go to uh, 50, 45, 42, let's say, which is really getting close to the uh, critical point, to the critical Reynolds number. And then at 42, it takes forever for the vortices to form. In fact, you can, you can uh, do all these things very accurately, and you can fit an exponential to the rate of growth of the fluctuations, and the time scale corresponding to that will be enormously large. So you plot this time scale for the formation of these vortices, as a function of the distance from the critical Reynolds number, and you can see that it diverges, although in practice, in any given experiment, it may not be infinity, but in, it, you can actually extrapolate, and you will see that it really takes infinite time at the critical Reynolds number exactly. Another thing you can think of where power loss like this may happen, very, I'm using some familiar examples, uh, this is a problem on which Professor Narsimha worked many years ago, uh, one of the first ones to work on. This is the formation of spots, turbulent spots. Uh, in a turbulent boundary layer, for instance, uh, turbulence does not appear uniformly at all, uh, instantly at, uh, uh, in the flow, but it will be seeded by what are known as turbulent spots. And these spots propagate in the direction of the stream, and as they propagate, they grow. And the leading edge of these spots, which is within which you have turbulence, outside of which the first order, first approximation, it's all quiet. The leading edge uh, travels at a certain speed, and the tailing edge travels at a certain speed, and there's a difference between these two speeds. Leading edge travels faster than the tailing edge does. You take the difference in these two speeds, which is really a measure of how fast these uh, things spread in the direction of propagation. But because of certain uh, geometric constraints, it also tells you how it spreads laterally. Then you can see, you can plot, you can measure this or different Reynolds numbers. And you can see that this difference in speed is really proportional to the distance from the critical Reynolds number to some power. And this power you can exactly uh, measure experimentally. It requires uh, a very good control on how you do these things. But, so there are many other instances I can give you where such power loss actually exists. The only thing is, um, we do not know where those power loss exactly come from or whether in fact we should expect power loss. I'm telling you that we find power loss. Um, but I know it from the experience uh, with these two flows, for instance. But it's not clear at all. Unlike in, um, in equilibrium phenomena where you can write down an expression for the free energy and then you do all your calculations with it, we don't have anything comparable. And so it creates um, new issues, but I will come back to that. And the another power of this uh, critical scaling in, um, in uh, critical phenomena equilibrium problems is that there is a real universality associated with these exponents. Of course, things in front and all that, they are to be calculated uh, for each problem. Now, not that every problem has the same exponents, this alpha, nu, and some others, and delta, etc., but at least there's a class of problems for which these are the same. So in fact, part of the problem really lies in getting these exponents, then you know to which class it belongs, and you can make your, your theoretical understanding of the problem. 
So that's uh, one of the uh, powers behind, uh, behind this. And furthermore, if you are living in a phase plane, appropriate phase plane, most interesting things happen along the critical lines or at the critical point. I know if you are in the phase transition diagram, for instance, liquid uh, uh, gas uh, transition, you will see that most important things do happen along critical lines. So now this work started with uh, Ben Widom, maybe, uh, roughly speaking, uh, about 1960-something, and uh, uh, then um, Leah Kadnov, then uh, Michael Fisher, and, and Ken Wilson, uh, who got the Nobel Prize, I think, in 1982. And so in a 20-year period, this became a very fertile ground, and um, then many interesting things began to happen before it lost its appeal, in my view. Now, uh, before um, this, 1960s, there was a pedigree in, uh, in turbulence that it, it inherited. Although people did not appreciate that, uh, as in my opinion, actually, if you remember, Paul McGraw's uh, spectrum is like this. Uh, phi of uh, the wave number, uh, Reynolds numbers, is k to the power minus 5 thirds, some function uh, which is of a k eta where viscosity appears, for instance, three eta. So you have something that looks sort of like that. I'm not making a perfect analogy. Or it's a Fourier transform, which is if you take the structure functions, which we have been talking a lot about. So this is velocity difference between two points for r within a certain range, known as the inertial range, separation distance. You again have the same, same form. This one for k um, uh, small, this function will be unity and you will have the five thirds. And of course, if you go deep into the viscous region, then this function becomes necessary. Now, this actually has been appreciated a posteriori by the people who worked in critical scaling, that in fact the pedigree in some sense uh, comes from turbulence. But um, although many people don't write it like this, the wall layer scaling is sort of similar. For example, if you say velocity gradient, the mean velocity gradient is 1 over y with all these factors in front, some function of this, for instance. You, you know uh, all, all this pretty well. People don't write it exactly like this, generally speaking. So this is, of course, not quite appreciated at all in uh, this uh, community that has uh, worked on this. Now, um, if you take, uh, for example, instead of the second power, say some pth power, then you have, just by taking um, by analogy to this, in the inertial range where this function is unity, or tending to unity, it will be of this sort. This is called the normal scaling. So if you sort of understood this, it is just a different power of the same thing. So the same physical mechanism sort of tells you everything you need to know about all P's. Now the, uh, the point about and this, is, this would be very reminiscent of what might be happening here. Now what, in fact, after many years of work, it looks like, what we have found is that there is this anomalous scaling where this goes like r to the power some zeta p, which is different from p thirds, except for the fact that the third order has this, this relation which comes from the Navier-Stokes equations, so there is no real um, approximation involved in this. So the general question would be, what kind of physics will give you each of these zeta p's? It's not enough if you know what comes, what creates this second order, or, or, or this two-thirds, or a third order as you know, but each, each order moment requires that you explain it in, in a different way. For example, where does this third order come from in the inertial range, for instance? Now, the general understanding is that um, if you are in the inertial range where viscosity is um, essentially not to be uh, considered, then maybe the, uh, the dynamics is something like the Euler dynamics, 
And Euler equations are time reversal symmetric. That is, if you change t to minus t, you have the same equations. In fact, therefore, you would think that a relation like this, which would be valid in the inertial range, would also obey the time reversal symmetry. But we know that it does not. This one particularly does not, because on the right-hand side, there is no time at all. But on the left-hand side, time appears through the velocity. So you change t to minus t, this will change sign, this will remain the same, and that cannot be. Therefore, time reversal symmetry is violated, and what is conserved here in this region is the energy flux. So the energy goes from one scale to another scale to another scale, at least conceptually. And therefore, this is a statement of the conservation of the energy flux, for instance. The, in the same way, would another zeta p, for instance, let's say zeta 4, would it correspond to some other conserved law, statistically conserved law? So that's the kind of theoretical question with, in which one is interested. So as I said, there is a, a lot of work that has gone on to measure these exponents, and there is the so-called extended scale similarity by Benzi and others, which has created a lot of ease with which you can measure them. And uh, what I have plotted here is the ratio of zeta p minus uh, uh, p by 3, that is the difference between normal scaling and the anomalous scaling, divided by p thirds. So if, in fact, it were Kolmogorov scaling, like this normal scaling, it would be zero, but it is not as a function of the art of the moment. You can see that it sort of goes in this fashion in some nonlinear way and you have to sort of explain each of these exponents in, in some way. So that's the general um, problem with which I, had been, I have been concerned for some time. And I have, in fact, measured or tried to measure uh, with my colleagues um, uh, these exponents in many uh, quantities, not only velocity differences, but in dissipation, and vorticity squared, and things of that sort. And each time, I know that it, I have come out with the conclusion that it is anomalous, at least in the, in the instances I know. One instance I would like to describe for you, uh, this comes from cosmology. This is the, professor, is the picture that Professor Kandaswamy used. And uh, actually, after listening to you, I put this slide on. Um, and what is this? Um, this is, these boundaries are telling you how the universe is expanding, and somewhere here at the bottom is the, is the Big Bang. So, between Big Bang and a certain stage known as the recombination, um, many things happen, a very, very complicated mess. Photons cannot even escape this, um, this mess of uh, um, material, high density, um, extremely high temperature and this sort of thing. But what happens is, around four, 400,000 years after Big Bang, now atoms begin to form. Atoms of the sort we know begin to form. Electrons fall into place in orbits around the, around the nucleus and things of that sort. And this is the source of all the material that we see in the, in the universe uh, today. So, it's around this time that the photons got freed um, uh, themselves, or free themselves up, and appear into the universe. And therefore, you can actually see, if you can measure the radiation that emerged from there, if it still survives, you can see what the status of the universe was around 400,000 years ago. Below this, it's really uh, not clear that there's any signal at all that has emerged from the from the original creation of the universe, but at least um, from around that time, 400,000, give or take a little bit, uh, you have a radiation that came out, and this radiation has, um, in my view, heroically been measured by a number of people in the last uh, uh, decades, and I think it changed cosmology forever, in my opinion. Now, if you look at how this thing appears, so this is now you lie on the ground and look at the sky, for instance. This is the sort of view you would see. And this is the uh, radiation that is left over from there. 
that uh, has been redshifted because the universe has been expanding, and therefore the temperature of these fluctuations is not what it was 400,000 years ago, but as you expand it has cooled, and it is estimated to be about 2.7 Kelvin, and it obeys the blackbody radiation formula accurately, really accurately. And at that time, at the time it was created, um, people were astonished how uniform it was, how homogeneous it was, and how, is how isotropic it was, etc. And of course, they were only looking at large scales. Um, and I know an instance where large scales seem to be homogeneous and isotropic, nearly, but small scales are not. This is the turbulence, right? In turbulence, you have intermittent phenomenon where large scales might all appear to be Gaussian and uh, nearly Gaussian, and then you have um, homogeneity, etc. But if you look at deeper into small structures, well, that's not true. So I got really interested in this problem, and one of the problems uh, which I thought um, I, uh, at least I had some interesting idea, but nobody ever paid any attention to it, but, um, but anyhow, I wrote a few papers. Um, so you can do the uh, kind of scaling that uh, one did for turbulence for this as well, and what uh, did we find? We found that, um, Barshad scaled myself, you plot the zeta p as a function of p, and the turbulence are crosses, and for this map, uh, they were exactly the same. Now that was a real surprise to me. I thought you would find a normal scaling for this problem, and I would really uh, try to understand what the heck was happening there. But now I, I have no idea how to deal with this. So, um, anyhow, so it's like turbulence, let's say, and I got interested in trying to ask, what is the Reynolds number? Uh, of course, no one else asks such questions but stupid ones like me. Uh, so I did ask, and I will tell you what the Reynolds number of this um, thing that came from the universe, from the recombination time from Big Bang days. So for that, we had to invent a new exponent, and this is of great interest for myself, for turbulence in general, Generally, if you take a turbulent signal like this, when you take as a function of space or time, um, usually the scaling considerations relate to the magnitudes. You take the velocity difference, you know, all this kind of stuff. But what it does not tell you is how or whether events are clustered together. Uh, sometimes they may be clustered in some places with larger density, and if you go to some other places, maybe they are not clustered. And I was led to think about this, um, because if you look at this CMB, for instance, certainly there is clustering, and one had to see whether it can be quantified somewhat. So if you take a signal like this, and you take uh, the zero of it, or the mean value, and look at the number of times the crossings have occurred, this is a problem on which I had worked in turbulence um, um, with Professor Narsima many, many years ago. So uh, I had some idea of what one could do. So uh, what you do is, you take an interval of time or space and ask how many of these crossings have occurred in that interval. So call, that, uh, call the number of crossings in an interval tau minus the average number of crossings as delta n tau. And now you take the square of that and average, and if you like, take the square root. And this, uh, you say, will go like a power law, some power of uh, tau, uh, by the force of uh, a habit that I just uh, explained to you earlier. There is no other reason why it should be a power law. But you can empirically know whether it is or not. What you find is uh, you measure uh, this exponent, and, and uh, this is a different Reynolds number, a wind tunnel at some Reynolds number, higher Reynolds number, another Reynolds number, etc. It has two parts to it. Take this one, for instance. The scaling has two parts. Uh, one part is this way, and the other part is 0.5 in all of them. And 0.5 is really for the random, uh, for the white noise. 
you can actually theoretically show that it is 0.5. So for very large scales, it looks like it is like white noise. Large scales are very um, uh, mellow in this sense. But there are smaller scales where, uh, for different, depending on the Reynolds number, you have a different exponent. And what we also did was, um, in fact, this was a more general observation that if you want to do a Reynolds number expansion for any property in turbulence, you can't be in Reynolds number, it can't be a one over Reynolds number either, although at low Reynolds numbers, that's the right way to do. But for high Reynolds numbers, this would be the right um, kind of expansion one would make. And just look at only these two terms. It should therefore be that if I have these exponents and I measure them at different Reynolds numbers and plot them as a function of one over log Reynolds numbers, I should get a straight line whose intercept would be this value and whose slope would be given by that A1. And in fact, that's what we found. So this is alpha as a function of one over log Reynolds numbers. This is the, this is the data for the turbulence. And when we measure the clustering exponent for the CMB radiation and plotted in on, on this, this gave the Reynolds number of 100, microscale Reynolds number, 100. I was shocked by that number, but I have no other explanation, no other quantitative means of telling you what the Reynolds number must be. So it's an uh, uh, ordinary Reynolds number would be 10 to the power 4, for instance. This is just an aside, just to tell you interesting games one can play. But the main point of my, my uh, uh, statement so far is simply that even on those scales, even on the cosmic scales, I certainly couldn't find anything that was, that was um, scaling other than anomalously. Uh, I thought this was a, a very important observation uh, because everybody in cosmology, and please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, were really not focused on any small scale inhomogeneities and the properties associated with them. Every year you have better data and every year we sort of repeat it to get to the same, same point. So now I want to move to another problem where finally maybe I have something that I can, um, I can imagine has normal scaling and maybe it has something interesting uh, as a consequence. So that's the scheme of my talk. So this is not a very strange quantity at all but one that is not measured very often. That's circulation. Uh, aerodynamicists know how important circulation is, and of course, um, everybody else who knows fluid dynamics knows how important it is. So, uh, you have a turbulent flow field, and you draw a, a contour of a certain size, and measure the circulation around it, and uh, then we can do the games uh, that we played before, that is to say, as I change the uh, area um, that is, uh, uh, that is uh, um, covered by the contour, well, we can ask what, what happens to circulation. So um, that's an area A, and I have this uh, contour um, of arbitrary sort for now, and then I can measure the circulation around it. And of course, we all know what it, what it is. It is um, omega dot n uh, in, uh, uh, integrated over this area. Now, it's not omega. It is omega dotted with n. So it's um, a component of vorticity uh, per perpendicular to this uh, area uh, covered there. Now, r in our, uh, in our old notation would be replaced by square root a. For example, if it were a circle, that would be exactly right. Even if it is not, it would be dimensionally, uh, effectively the same, same thing. Now, there is very little literature on this. Uh, in fact, um, Sasha Migdal, uh, who is a quantum field theorist, he is the one who uh, sort of brought this to um, the attention of a few people. 
And uh, he wrote his paper around the same time as we wrote ours, where we measured it in the wake behind the cylinder uh, at low Reynolds numbers. And thereafter, we also did it in numerical simulations with small, small data cubes. And a couple of others also uh, followed after that. Now, uh, since we have been working with high Reynolds number simulations that P.K. Young talked about today, um, now where the box size is 8192 cubes, so it is relatively large, and it goes from here to here, a Reynolds number going from there to there, it seemed like this is a good time to revisit it, and which is what we did. And uh, the PK also computed 16384 a little bit, but we have used it, but I will not discuss it. So this is the, all the data, which we may not want to worry about. A quarter million processors. Um, a ratio of the large scale to small scale would be um, at the highest Reynolds number, about 2274. So you can expect some reasonable scaling and maybe conclude something uh, sensible. Now, will the results depend upon the type of contour one uses? For example, if I use the rectangle like this, um, both LX and LY uh, within the inertial range, or if I stretch it out in this direction or stretch it out in another, will uh, this make a difference or not? So what you can do is take many rectangles and um, and compute the probability density for all these rectangles, but keeping the area the same. So some of them are slender, and uh, this is almost uh, square, etc. You see that there is hardly any difference. This is now the circulation around this contour and the probability density of that in some units. Um, you can see it's hardly uh, different from one to the other. So the first statement that I would make, therefore, is circulation statistics depend only on the area of the loop and not on its shape. Of course, one could try triangles and, uh, and all the other things, but the only thing we have verified is a rectangle, so uh, please excuse, therefore, this slight exaggeration, but, um, but that's the general idea. As long as the largest dimension is also contained in the inertial range, if it go, or the smallest dimension is also contained in the inertial range. Now, what about the nature of the contour? Suppose I have a contour like this, um, L1 um, one limb and L2 the other. Now, if I go from here to, uh, well, from here to all the way, I get some circulation, it may have a certain sign. Then I go from here to here, I'll get a circulation around this contour, which may have a different sign. So should I add them up vectorially, or should I just add them like scalars? So that's the question. And it turns out it's not very hard to show. If I have to use it as a scalar, that is, sum them up, like the, the magnitude of this and the magnitude of that, then the variance of this uh, circulation will go like area to the power two-thirds. If, on the other hand, if the vector area rule were the norm, then I should get one-third, which is something that you can verify. And uh, that's the result of the verification. So gamma uh, squared, area here, L1 squared, L2 squared, divided by the square normalization by Kolmogorov scale. You can see that it's two-thirds, pretty much. And there's only this region here where it is unit power. And the unit power corresponds to scales which are in the viscous region. So it is really telling you that we have scales that are in the viscous region. So the conclusion is that the scalar area rule holds, not vector area rule. Now, I have to still understand exactly the implications of this, but at least I know that that is the case. In fact, you can do the same thing for a loop, eight loop, uh, as, uh, as it's called here. So it's not just going once like that, but it's going another one and another one, so eight of them. And still, you have the scalar uh, uh, rule working. Now then, you can measure the probability density of the circulation uh, within this uh, region. 
And normally what would you do? You would try to see if there's some variable that you can uh, normalize it with, which will collapse all the data. In turbulence velocity, for instance, we know there is no such thing. And that's part of the reason for all these uh, complications one has. Now, uh, for the circulation, it turns out that the Kolmogorov scaling tells you it's very easy to write down exactly the same arguments that Kolmogorov used for velocity differences, uh, that the cube of the circulation divided by fourth power of the, of the length scale divided by energy dissipation. So this is the, it has the right dimensions for the cube of the circulation and the corresponding PDF of that. You can see that the collapse for all R's from 80 to 300, which is a reasonable range. And in fact, you can look at the tails a little bit better and the tails are going with a very low probability density also um, are, are together except here maybe some very small differences or very low probabilities. So you have PDFs for R in the inertial range collapse well on Kolmogorov scaling. They're very far from Gaussian, but they are Kolmogorov. So that's sort of already very interesting. And this, is, uh, this, is t this tells you, of course, everything about moments but it is useful to look at the same type of moments that we looked at before. So you take um, uh, uh, the circulation around a contour of size r, raise it to power p, get the average value, plot it against r or eta. If you have power loss, you must have um, linear, linear curves in all of them, different, each curve for different values of p. And if you want to be a little bit more um, rigid, you can take the slope of this, and the slope is plotted here, which in certain range of scales, this in the inertial range, which is decided by some other means, you will see that they are essentially flat. So then, moments of circulation scale quite well. Now is the important thing. You plot the um, the exponent for the pth moment as a function of p, unlike the case of velocities and any other quantity that I have looked so far, this looks to me like a line, a straight line. And I will come back to this one. Uh, perhaps I should show you, um, well, the scaling exponents are very closely linear with the r of the moment. And in fact, to compare it with velocity differences, so this is the velocity differences. Uh, this is the circulation that I just uh, plotted with more data points in it. So now if this is actually true, it would be really exciting. And uh, first of all, they are not exactly Kolmograph, but that's not the main point. If they're all linear, then you have a very interesting, uh, interesting uh, phenomenon. And the interesting phenomenon is you don't need any multi-scaling or multi-fractal scaling in order to explain this, but you only need one dimension that tells you what the what tells you uh, how it deviates from the from the Kolmograph, and it turns out that d this can be explained as um, as a monofractal or unifractal or just a fractal with a dimension of two and a half. Now we have to work on that, but um, that's what it says. So, and if you want to be uh, further uh, interested in, uh, this is now getting too detailed, but basically, if it is indeed true that in the inertial range everything is uh, constant with respect to R, um, the flatness, so-called flatness, should be a constant. And in fact, it's not exactly a constant, as you can see that it tends to be a constant. And this is increasing Reynolds number makes it tend more and more flat. And you can measure a characteristic of this and plot it as a function of Reynolds number. And, and that, that measure should go to zero when it is really flat. And that will become so around 1800 or 1900, which, is, which means I have to wait another decade or so in order to 
get all this right. So the point of uh, the whole exercise that I have uh, made so far, I will uh, uh, want to finish this a bit soon, and I want to make a few general remarks. Uh, the point I have been uh, making so far is that um, I am uh, moderately excited because I've been looking at this thing for almost four decades, um, while also doing other things, I must say, and everything had seemed anomalous. Uh, maybe this is not. Um, now, that's a speculation. Now, this is all uh, correct. Circulation statistics depend only on the area of the loop, not on the shape. Scalar area, not vector area rule. PDFs collapse on Kolmogorov variables. Uh, circulation seems to be a reside in a fractal set of about 2.5. As I say, one needs to double the Reynolds number before being conclusive. It'll take another five years or so. So there uh, ends uh, my story with, uh, with uh, uh, the scaling in turbulence. And in fluid mechanics in general, there have been um, uh, many interesting results, and I have learned a lot of stuff along the way. But it is not clear that anything important has actually happened. I was complaining to Professor Narsimha the other day, the other day that I have spent um, him I do not want to include in this. Uh, he is far more accomplished than me. But, uh, uh, but uh, how long has it been? It's 50 years, almost. And what do I know for certain? Um, what can I tell you? I don't know the answer. Um, so it's a, an expression of frustration. Um, but I also don't want to leave it on a sour note uh, that it is not, uh, not welcoming of young students who are here. So I want to maybe say a few words, especially to the young students here. The professors and older people, uh, they don't need any advice from me. And in any case, uh, they are too far along to be benefiting from any advice. Um, I give you these few words, um, um, especially for Indian students. Um, there is a certain character. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'll shoot myself in the foot by generalizing things. But there are certain characters that one will have to uh, be aware of. Associate with people who are generally smarter than you, but don't lose, lose your core to them. Smart people are good for certain things, but you know, you, you have to have your own core. Develop a small support group within which you can talk freely without worrying that you might be labeled as stupid. If you don't have such a group, you will never be able to explain your, um, you think through your stupidest ideas, some of which may be the brightest ideas. Um, it can't be your professor, although you would be really lucky if your professor were one of them. But you should have a group of people with whom you can uh, do this. Then, no one will give you credit for free, but you will learn how to get the just credit for your work if you follow some rules. And I write down some rules for you. Know what you want to do and be prepared to sacrifice something for it. If you don't sacrifice, no one will take you seriously. If all you want to do is come to your lab at 9 o'clock in the morning, leave at 4.30 with a tie on, which nobody here does, but Liebman used to complain about Mahinder, so I'm reminded of that. Then no one will take you seriously. Uh, you want to be taken seriously, which means people have to see that you actually sacrifice a little bit for something. Maybe you don't eat lunch every day and work through the lunch. Uh, I, I'm just making it uh, ridiculous in the end, but... Learn to make a case for yourself without pretense or insincerity. People will find out that you are insincere um, if you are insincere. It doesn't take that long. Uh, people generally are smart in our business, and so you should, you should be mindful of that. This is another very important thing, especially for uh, Indian students. Um, I can be excused for saying this because 
I am one myself and I suffer from all these weaknesses that I am telling you about. Learn the art of speaking and writing formally and effectively, especially as a way to persuade or influence people. And finally, learn to defend yourself without being argumentative. You know, uh, you ask a question, somebody will say, yeah, yeah, that doesn't mean anything. And then you still have a point to make, but you have to be able to make a point without being argumentative, without losing your, your tone, your patience, uh, whatever. And learn to handle criticism without allowing it to warp your essence. And in fact, some of the greatest scientists have suffered from this, this uh, thing. I was talking to you about um, one of the greatest scientists I've known about, um, but I, you know, he too had such problems, for instance. I think it's really very important we grow in a certain environment, and an environment where, which is not exactly the most conducive environment for, um, for uh, free expression of oneself. Um, and sometimes it becomes important to do that. And I want to say, if this is all you remember from uh, my three talks, um, I hope it will be worth it. And thank you very much for your um, time and uh, effort. Sure. Thank you very much, Professor, for that wonderful talk. Uh, we have time to take uh, questions. I have uh, one more thing. Um, I told you um, that Chandrasekhar's last work was this. This is the book he wrote, uh, Newton's Principia. Um, and he was uh, obviously very proud of this thing. Um, and he gave a talk about this, and I, I heard about this. Um, it was not particularly reviewed well, but, uh, but uh, it was clear uh, from everything I know that this was of central importance to him. And he died uh, very soon after uh, the paper, the book got uh, published. So I asked uh, Rama if uh, the ICTS library has a copy, and she said it does not. So I brought this copy and I give it to you, Rama, for the library. Uh, you can keep it too, but, <laughs> but uh, so I wanted to thank you very much for everything. Now, yeah, I can, I can answer questions, yeah. Yeah. Temperature or the velocity? I mean, it should be temperature or...? No, it's temperature, all right. But in fact, uh, it is in some way more like velocity than temperature. Because of the expansion of the universe, it should be more like that. Yeah. But you are absolutely right. Yeah. There's one here. Yeah. Well, it's very interesting that um, <clears throat> circulation follows all those uh, laws that you showed, yeah. but not the velocity. That's right. Do you think in general, vorticity is in some sense a more fundamental variable than velocity? Yeah. Um, of course, if you just take vorticity and average over the area, it doesn't do any better than, than, uh, um, uh, than the... Uh, so let's say... The vorticity uh, averaged over an area will yeah. give you the circulation. Yeah. So... Um, what we have been looking at um, are quantities that are positive definite, like ordinary squared and so on. They have the same problems. But if you take circulation, which is just vorticity, uh, as you say, averaged uh, uh, over an area, um, but it has to be uh, perpendicular to the area that you're looking at, right? I mean, that's what the Stokes theorem tells you. So if you do that, then it seems like somehow much simpler. Um, but I don't know if it translates to vorticity period, that is not omega dot n, but just omega. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So uh, one might ask um, the question that you asked, is vorticity somehow uh, more uh, fundamental or not? 
But you know, in a complex uh, flow like, uh, like turbulence, it's entirely possible that there's some scaling uh, parts and some non-scaling parts are more complex or multi-scaling parts. And it may be that vorticity is the one that uh, has a simpler behavior. If that is actually true, if I could state that without uh, you know, many caveats, at least I have to wait five more years, uh, I think that would be very important. Yeah. Just a follow-up, maybe I didn't get it right. So circulation is vorticity multiplied by area, no? So, and that seems to be less singular. It, well, it just looks like L to the power four-third, yeah. and omega is singular. So that may show up as a, as a multi-scaling or non-multi-scaling. I mean, what, circulation, you didn't divide by the area, right? Circulation is just u dot dl. So that should be vorticity times area. u dot dl. But it is also omega dot n uh, yeah. a, a integrated over the, over the area. Times area. So, so area multiplication seems to smear out Rather the strike. singularity. Yeah. I mean, we have known that this is how you have to do it anyhow. Yes, right? right? We have always known that you should really not be looking at anything like dissipation, but you should average it over a certain interval. Obukov taught us in 1962. Um, the point is, uh, even though you do that for all other quantities, they seem anomalous. And the moderate excitement I have is really articulated by Professor Narasimha. That is to say, you have vorticity, and somehow uh, it seems to behave in a much normal way. Yeah. It seems that in quantum turbulence, where you have two velocity fields coupled together at finite temperature, we now observed experimentally, and also it's theoretically predicted, that there is enhancement of intermittency. So would you comment how that fits into this overall picture? Um, I would uh, ask uh, whether you have any intermittency in very low temperature only when, when you have only superfluid. Do you know anything about it? That we don't know because nobody was able to measure in the zero temperature limit. Yeah. Yeah. But in uh, uh, temperature range you are talking about, you have such a complicated behavior. You have normal fluid, you have superfluid, you have superfluid vortices and interaction among all three of them. And it's really hard for me to uh, say what it would be like. And certainly, I don't understand this non-monotonic behavior that you were telling me earlier today. Uh, in three-dimensional hydrodynamic 3D MHD turbulence, yeah. there has been always a debate of the scaling of one, the Kolmogorov scaling or the Eroshnikov crash. That's and right. Yeah. So, your, your comment on that? Yeah. Um, I think the debate is still on, um, but uh, maybe uh, if you do similar things for the magnetic field, maybe you will uh, get to a state where you can say something concrete. But nobody has done that to the best of my knowledge. Um, uh, you talked about the turbulence pots and all. So, do you see the turbulence pot for all kind of flows uh, when they go to turbulent state, well bounded as well as uh, free flows? No, it doesn't appear in all the flows. So, uh, di different flows um, have different ways of transitioning to turbulence. But for channels and boundary layers and so on, you have spots and they are pretty well defined. Uh, and it's amazing uh, how well um, Professor Narsimha was able to characterize them now what, um, uh, 60 years ago. Yeah, 60 years ago. Oh. And anyhow, so they are very, very easy to characterize. You can measure things uh, re pretty accurately. Okay. You have to have good control on the flow. So, do you have for some scaling for them also? Scaling law, how they, when they develop? Previously, they are very small, then they grow. Yes, 
the only scaling law I know is the empirical scaling law. That is, uh, if you take, as I said, the difference between the leading edge and the trailing edge velocities, and say UL minus UT, for instance, you, um, if uh, it were just normal scaling, if you raise it to the power two, that will go like Reynolds number minus the critical Reynolds number. In fact, that's how you can determine the critical Reynolds number. But the power one gets is slightly different from half, and the way you get the power is not really independent of what the critical Reynolds number is, because it's not given to you by hand. So you have to sort of do it in, a, in, a, uh, in some uh, collaborative way. That is, you assume you have a certain scaling, and then you see whether it fits the data, and then you change it to another scaling, and see whether it gives you a better fit, etc. So you have to do it in, in uh, some iterative way. Unless you, uh, see, this is another problem with the experiments near the critical point. Uh, many times you have to have some theoretical understanding of uh, what the exponent is and how uh, you might actually uh, measure it, uh, because it's uh, always an interplay between theory and uh, the actual measurement. So that problem certainly exists here. What I was saying was, I have no idea why it should be half or 0.45 or 0.4 or anything like that. And there is no um, uh, free energy that you could write down and then you could uh, see what its scaling must be by knowing what uh, universality class it belongs to. There is no such thing. Yeah, um, I have a question here. Yeah. yeah. So what was the motivation behind uh, choosing circulation as a candidate that would, you know, follow normal scaling? Um, was there any a priori uh, expectation or reasoning that it would uh, lead to so, normal scaling? Uh, how I know that is, um, Sasha Migdal is a quantum field uh, theorist. And in quantum field theory, you talk about loops and things like that, and he was very much interested in in uh, that sort of thing. And at one meeting in uh, Italy, in uh, Israel, where he and I both attended, he asked me whether this can be measured. And um, he was developing a theory at the same time. So we went ahead and we actually made the measurements and we wrote a paper um, as soon after he wrote his paper. So at that point, my motivation was really to see whether uh, there is some agreement between theory and and uh, experiment. And his theory is not foolproof theory. For instance, he wouldn't tell you that uh, the scaling of the probability density on the Kolmogorov variables is the right thing to say. He simply says, well, maybe it is like that, maybe it is not. Um, so he was not, not entirely sure about that. So in any case, um, when we made the measurements uh, at low Reynolds numbers, it was really not, to be, not very conclusive. This was 1995, uh, first time we made 1994. So I had to wait this long in order to get reasonably high Reynolds number. And as I say, I have to wait another five to 10 years. Yeah. So uh, I hope I'll be around. <laughs> the scaling behavior of circulation that you showed is very, very interesting. Uh, there is a, a detail that I must not be understanding properly. Uh, the, when you talk about figure of eight or other yeah, more yeah. complex uh, yeah. loops, yeah. Uh, the sense in which you are going around the sub-loops is changing from one That's loop right. to another. It's That's flipping. Right. That's right. And so in application of the Stokes theorem, the unit normal direction is changing. That's correct. And so, are you doing the addition following that? If you are, then of course everything should be perfect. No, I'm not. I'm doing only the magnitudes. So why does it work? Because aren't you... That's, that's the thing. That's how it so works. So how can a violation of uh, that circulation theorem no, no, I, not the, matter? The, 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 I'm not violating any circulation theorem. So that's my misunderstanding. So, um, so I measure circulation around this loop. Yes. I measure the circulation around this loop, even though the two uh, may be in opposite directions, I just take their magnitudes and add them up. 
that's that's the mystery of it. Yeah, I mean, I'm not violating uh, the no, rule. but but the I mean, the relationship between that arithmetic that you did and its relation to average vorticity over that area only works if you follow the change in signs. That's, that's that a very good point. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, but this is how it works. Okay. It's a mystery then. This is how it works, yeah. It certainly does not follow the, the vectorial uh, addition. I mean, that was the thing I spent some time on. Yeah, um, very interesting thing about the CMB. I've never thought about it. So, have you some explanation? Um, the explanation is uh, very uh, trivial. Uh, the, uh, as I said, the, I know in turbulence it's always like that, but is on the large scale it looks uh, really homogeneous and very uh, statistically everything seems um, uh, fine. But if you go deeper into it, there is this intermittency. The, inter the small scales somehow refine themselves on smaller and smaller uh, part of the space. And uh, that is what is happening there as well. So in fact, if you look at the scales or which, um, the range of scales or which um, you have the scaling on CMB, it's exactly in the middle of these huge oscillations uh, that they have in the power spectrum, the spherical harmonics expansion. So um, I don't have a really good explanation for it. But it does not surprise me that such a behavior exists because I'm so used to other flows where that is true. Yeah, I mean, that huge oscillation is because of acoustic yeah. uh, sound waves. Yeah. And that's the first, time, first wavelength which is entering the Hubble radius. Yeah. So it is not even oscillated once. Yeah. So, and even the smallest wavelength which people have measured mm. may have oscillated 10 times or something. It's something like so that. So unless there is some strong mode coupling effect which is happening, yeah. it's very difficult to see something non-trivial like uh, some cascade or some something happening there. So, yeah. But it's an interesting observation. So. Yeah, I don't know about the cascade part, but what uh, my colleague in UCSD, uh, Carl Gibson, has gone on to do is to construct a theory of the uh, universe based on turbulence um, at uh, the recombination time. So he thinks all the uh, classical understanding of the way uh, people talk about the creation of galaxies and so on is all wrong in the, in the sense that they don't take into account this fact that the field, the CMB field at t equal to zero, that is recombination time, is really like uh, turbulence. Yeah, we can discuss. Yeah, 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 sure. But I don't know that I know any insights, serious insights. Uh, surely, uh, you will take the uh, area integral of uh, vorticity, omega dot n. Now, if we compare uh, two-dimensional versus three-dimensional turbulence, or maybe a symmetric turbulence where one vorticity component dominates, do you think that the properties of the circulation will be substantially changed or not? I don't know. I don't know. But if you have a... Um, and you say that uh, this is the... You say that the shape of the loop does not matter. So that statement may not be changed, may not be uh, right in those more general cases, right? It could be. Um, one, in principle, you can change the shape of the contour. You should, I mean, I, I should. Uh, so far, only uh, rectangles of different aspect ratio have been considered. That's the only thing I know at the moment. I should do triangles, I should do circles, I should do other things, but okay, it should be done eventually. Yeah. This um, uh, CMB again. On the large scales, you're bounded by cosmic variance. So, in fact, I would say it's non-Gaussian there because you don't have enough realizations on the largest spatial scales. So, in fact, it becomes more Gaussian, I would imagine, as you go to smaller and smaller scales no. because you have many realizations of a high wavelength feature, right? So, you're, you're seeing statistically more realizations of, of this. No, it's not nothing to do with realizations. 
It's a fact that if you go to smaller scales, uh, they begin to uh, fluctuate more and more, and they will reside on finer and finer uh, part of the space. So in, in reality, um, the, it's true that you have many uh, more real, many more data points to consider, but it doesn't follow that you, do, you will get a Gaussian. There is no such thing as if you take larger number of points, you will converge to something like a central limit, uh, uh, what the central limit theorem tells. No, that doesn't happen. Okay. I uh, thought uh, you were all tired, so I deliberately made it short. Thank you very much again. I think there's another question. If, if you, okay. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. The scaling behavior was uh, quite encouraging for the circulation. Uh, so don't you think that there can be other candidates as well, like the uh, angle between the uh, eigen, strain eigenvectors and uh, vorticity? Uh, that can show similar behavior? I, um, I don't really know. Maybe uh, Jeremy or, uh, or somebody might comment on it. The scale, but the vorticity does. Okay. Okay, probably we can do it much better and don't have to wait five years for that. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. great. Right. It's uh, not very inconsistent with what I've said so far. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I think I'll ask one final question if uh, you allow me. Yeah. So, uh, Chandrasekhar in his uh, essays talks about beauty as a strangeness in proportion and a harmony of ideas. Right. Uh, do you have similar sentiments with regard to turbulence? <laughs> the only reason I got into turbulence is uh, sitting right there. <laughs> so I was uh, more attuned to doing other things, <laughs> but uh, uh, Professor Narsima was so um, uh, powerful intellectually and uh, he was so... Uh, Without saying anything, he was um, persuasive. And um, the sheer pleasure of working with him is what drove me into this. And uh, I have stuck around uh, by and large, but I have wandered around a little bit as well. So, um, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I, I don't really know what to say, whether... Um, Complexity has its own beauty. Uh, if you take the image of a jet, for instance, and uh, put it side by side with, say, a Mandelbrot set or something like that, which is a beautiful object, you actually see in the jet the swirls and tendrils and everything, and the way they are organized, they arrange themselves, it's beautiful in itself. So, in fact, if you are of a type of person who seeks to uh, look for certain symmetry, certain beauty uh, that is hidden by, uh, by a lot of uh, clutter, um, then uh, this is a good field for you. Um, you know this uh, saying, uh, the, the vessel that contains the truth is, and uh, the truth is hidden by the golden um, lid. I mean, I know the Sanskrit thing, but I, I would not say it. So the point is, um, if you just look at a uh, field like turbulence, it looks like a mess. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you are coming from, let's say, a different orientation, it will appear to you, to you like a mess. And in fact, many people have told me, and it's even on record, that you're wasting your time by working in a field like this. But on the other hand, there's a certain majesty to such complexity. And the fact is that it is so um, universally applicable, that is, the turbulence everywhere, and turbulence on all scales, and turbulence on, of uh, different varieties. Is there some hidden element of uh, grandeur in this thing, uh, beyond what you uh, see on the surface? I think if you, uh, 
in the end, you may really not see anything, and you should be prepared for this. An analogy that Leo Kadnoff gave was, uh, you have an apple, and uh, you sort of start eating the apple, there's a core that remains, and that core is solid and uh, it is there. Now, if you take an onion, you sort of peel, and you peel, and you peel, and peel, and there's nothing at the, at the uh, end of it. So, uh, this may well be onion science, that is to say, you know, you do things more and more, and you look for greater and greater depths of truth, and maybe you find nothing. In which case, you will be disappointed, I have wasted my time, and um, many others may. Um, on the other hand, that may not be the case. It's just too hard and it may take a lot more um, uh, control and a lot more elegance to get there. Um, and maybe uh, you have to find something interesting and difficult. What is more interesting? Uh, I don't know. There may be many things that are interesting. But would I be interested in being part of a huge experiment where there are 6,000 people working um, on the same thing and I know maybe some small part of it, uh, absolutely not. Um, uh, am I lamenting that um, um, we don't have big facilities? Uh, to some degree, yes, but in fact, part of the, um, the merit of turbulence is you can create your own flows without much problem. But it is also uh, a curse, it is a curse because you can't uh, you can't do to way you can't do stretch your parameters you can't do them at the highest possible Reynolds numbers or Rayleigh numbers or whatever without getting too expensive so the familiarity of the field in some way is the reason why it looks very complex to us but if you are not that familiar if you couldn't see what exactly was going on all the time I would say I, a little bit of mystery would have helped the field a lot but it, it's not mysterious because you can see nobody smokes anymore, but people who used to smoke could see turbulence, right? I mean, so you think, yeah, this is the thing. Okay, what is the big deal? But that's not really where it is. That's really not where it is.